Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Owen Farsi. I'm a longtime teacher here at Kaplan in the pre-medical programs and also a former director of, uh, of pre-medical programs. Uh, and I'm very excited to welcome all of you here to our event this evening. Uh, it should be a very promising, very, very fun event, I should say, uh, where we're going to talk all about what it takes to actually get into medical school. Uh, so I will be the host for this evening's event, and I want to, of course, welcome all of you who have been part of our previous events this week as part of So You Want to Be a Doctor Week. Uh, welcome back to those of you who joined us for last night's personal statement workshop. Uh, and of course, all of you who are just joining us for the first time this evening, uh, welcome for the first time, and I hope that you enjoy tonight's experience. Uh, now, I know that all of you aren't necessarily here to hear from me this evening. Uh, you want to hear from my fellow panelists who have actually gotten into medical school and are well on their way to their career as physicians. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the panelists who you'll be hearing from this evening. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce Adriana Lee, who is joining us from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Adriana, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're also being joined this evening. Thanks, Owen, for having me. Glad to have you, Adriana. Thank you. Uh, we're also being joined this evening by Abneris Rivera, who's joining us from the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. Uh, Abneris, welcome. Hello. And our final guest this evening is Danielle Patel. Uh, Danielle is joining us from Tulane University School of Medicine down in Louisiana. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you, the three of you, for joining us. We're going to have a very fun, very productive conversation this evening. And I know the burning question in everyone's mind is, what did each of you do to actually get into medical school? Because we know that that can be a big challenge for a lot of students. Uh, but before we get in there, I just want to remind all the students who are joining us this evening online uh, that this is a very active event. You should be seeing a, a chat roll on the side of your screen. So please uh, participate in the chat via that panel. Uh, you can send us questions if you'd like along the way. We're going to be discussing every aspect of the pre-medical experience this evening, everything from the courses that one chooses to, stay, to take, the, uh, the uh, of course, wonderful aspects of GPA and MCAT score, how each of you study for the MCAT, and then, of course, the intricacies of the admissions process as well, from interviews to personal statements to actually filling out the, the applications themselves. So it should be a lively discussion. We've got about, uh, we've got about uh, two hours to get through this conversation. And something tells me that's probably not gonna be nearly enough because there's so <laughs> much that we can discuss. So to kick things off, let's just do a quick introduction. Uh, Adrian, if you wouldn't mind starting us off, just give us the, uh, I guess the short abridged version of how you came to be a medical student. Sure, so it's nice to see you all here tonight. I'm really glad to be helping you guys all on your journey to medical school. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm currently at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and I'm a first year, as Owen said. Um, I did my undergraduate education at Rice University in Houston where I studied biochemistry and cell biology. Um, at Rice University, I was also a student brand ambassador and I'm currently a medical brand ambassador at the University of Maryland. And I'm also teaching um, MCAT for Kaplan on Live Online. So I have a long history with Kaplan. Um, I've wanted to be a doctor pretty much ever since I started high school um, through my, my grandparents. Um, my grandma was a trauma surgeon in China and she really inspired me to go into medicine. So it's kind of a little bit about my story. And it sounds like you've, you've said those things a few times before. It sounded a little, a little bit like you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe a couple, five dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to the interviews a little bit later on and how some of those questions come up. But thank you, Adriana. Uh, Abnaris, would you mind going next? Tell us a little bit about what your journey has been like. Yes. Um, hi, everyone from Puerto Rico. Um, I am a second year medical student in the medical school of Puerto Rico. And um, I have known Kaplan since my MCAT prep course in college, um, and I'm now a student brand ambassador for my class. I, I have been for the past two years. Um, I'm the first doctor in my family, so that's pretty awesome and pretty scary at the same time. And um, I just hope to help you guys, you know, um, guide yourselves into reaching your goals and your dreams and to show you that it is possible to get there. And, you know, it's, it's really, really reachable. Absolutely. And I know that's, that's heartening words for a lot of the students who are going to be going through the application process in the very near future. Uh, I right. see that about 50% of our audience this evening, or 57%, I should say, uh, is going to be applying during this very next cycle. So just, uh, just a few months away from the opening of that application window. Excellent. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, and Danielle, finally, how about you? What brought you into medicine? 
So for some reason, just in my DNA, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from the moment I was born. I couldn't tell you how or why I was born with that. So during college, um, I went in, I thought that the sure track and the formula for success was to study biology. So I picked the hardest sounding biology major I could find. And after two years, I was doing terribly and I was miserable. So I changed my major to evolutionary anthropology, and I also started working more outside of school. I spent about five years between college and my gap year working as a home health aide. Uh, and that really gave me my why for medicine. And so um, I met Kaplan, like many of us, through my MCAT prep course, changed my life. I will not leave you guys alone. That's why I'm still <laughs> here, even though I'm no longer a student fan, brand ambassador. I just tweet for you guys, mostly. I'm lurking on the MCAT Twitter as Danielle the intern. Uh, I took a gap year after undergrad. Uh, I attended the University of Michigan, go blue, final four bound. I just got to put it out there. And <laughs> I moved a thousand miles away from everything I knew and loved down to Louisiana for medical school. And we just finished our first year coursework. So I'm officially almost a second year. Excellent. Later, that must feel very, very good to be done with that first year. Definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you all for, for joining us this evening. And a thing I want to highlight from the very beginning uh, is that we've got really three very different stories taking place this evening. And I think that's probably going to be a theme that's going to show up time and time again throughout this conversation. There is really no one way to get into medical school and to become a physician. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll certainly see that as we progress a little bit deeper into this conversation this evening. Now, before we kick off some of the, uh, the specifics, uh, I do want to mention to all the students out there watching this evening uh, that there is also a, a bit of a sweeps stakes taking place this night, this evening, you should see at the top of the chat roll a link to a form where you can enter uh, for, uh, for that sweepstakes. And we will be announcing uh, the recipients uh, of the sweepstakes a little bit later on uh, in today's uh, in tonight's uh, show. So uh, take a look at that. And if you're having any trouble finding it, go ahead and chat us uh, with your difficulties. So let's go ahead and kick things off by talking a little bit about the pre-med experience and specifically all those wonderful prerequisite classes that we get to take. <laughs> Uh, so, Danielle, I'd like to start the conversation with you. You mentioned you actually struggled a little bit with the pre-med workload. Give us a little more detail there. I struggled a lot of it, to be honest. Um, I, I like to kind of break down the illusion that the pre-med student has to be perfect, because while you are expected to have a great MPAT, MCAT score and a great GPA, you're, the journey isn't as smooth sailing for everybody. So, most people are stressing over getting A minuses where I was stressing over getting C minuses in some courses. Um, things started to hit the fan for me in a bad way when I, I think, when, it was really the biochemistry course that threw me for the loop. I actually, actually retook that course um, along with physics too. I retook that as well to boost my GPA because I did so poorly the first time. I barely passed um, and I, I didn't want the medical schools to see that I was giving up. I knew that having those C minuses on my GPA was not a good looking thing, but at the same time, I wanted to show them that I had the tenacity and that I was a fighter and I was going to keep working to prove to them that I was capable of what they would be asking of me. So it's, you know, it's tough because I was also working a lot during undergrad. So maybe if I wasn't working, I would have been able to do better in those courses and not have the GPA turnaround story that I do have. But at the same time, I think working played a lot into my success in my application, which we can talk about later as well. Okay, excellent. Just to, to double down on that point for a moment, you mentioned that you think that the fact that you retook those courses uh, showed tenacity in the med school applications. Did any of the, the schools question you on the grades? Nobody questioned me outright. Um, I think that by the time I was offered interviews, they looked at it and accepted the fact that that was my story. I think schools that were not okay with that just didn't offer me an interview to begin with. And the schools I did interview at, I made sure to bring up in my interview the other factors that were going on that led me to get those grades and the fact that I was willing to work harder and willing to admit my weaknesses and improve upon them. Uh, but I think that tenacity was the reason why I was brought to the school I'm at now, Tulane, because we're down here in New Orleans, and New Orleans is routinely wrecked by hurricanes, the most recent really disastrous one being Katrina in 05. And so this entire city is built on grit and tenacity and rising from ashes. And so I was so drawn to the school and their mission and the culture down here that the second I walked in the doors for the interview, I knew I was going to get in. I knew it was the place for me. So I think that's a good little story about turning failures into kind of stepping stones to success. 
And I think that that's the biggest takeaway right there. I see several several of the students who are joining us this evening mentioning that they your story sounds a lot like theirs. They've had to take classes over. They've struggled at certain points. So it's great to know that there's a success story out there about that. That not even is just a success story. It's it's you're taking the negative and turning it into a positive. Definitely. Um, Nurse, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about the classes that you took as an undergrad and how that's how that factored both into your decision about a major and ultimately how you think that impacted mm -hmm. uh, your uh, your application script. Okay, so I'm, I majored in molecular biology, um, and I actually loved it. It's not something that most people say, but I did. Um, I think that the classes that most um, impacted me as a medical student was the immunology class and the cancer biology class. Um, I actually, when I finished my immunology class, I remember emailing my professor and saying, for people like you, I actually want to dedicate my life to this because she was so awesome. And actually immunology class, I think was one of the things that helped me most throughout med school because we actually had only like one and a half week to learn the whole immunology course versus like I had already taken it and it was pretty awesome because I was like, yeah, I got this, you know. Um, and then cancer biology, um, it's really what I want to specialize in. So it's a class that you know, opened my eyes and told me like, wow, this is what I'm going to do. So just like experiencing different classes is pretty fun. And, you know, playing around with your schedule and the classes that you take, I would really recommend that because med school leaves, you know, time for, you know, experiencing or trying new stuff. So college is the time to do that. Absolutely. Undergrad is definitely the time to, to branch out a little bit, explore different interests. Adriana, I saw you nodding along to a lot of what Abner was saying. It sounds like you had a similar experience. Yeah, so actually I went into college thinking that I wanted to major in chemistry. So I took AP Chem in high school. I like absolutely loved it. I, you know, I was like, I definitely, you know, I, I want to be a doctor, but I think I want to, you know, do chemistry. Like I want to do nephrology, something ha that has to do with like acid and bases, stuff like that. So I went in thinking that I wanted to do chemistry. Um, my sophomore year, I took one of the like higher, not like super high level, but one of the upper level, like above orgo um, level chemistry classes. And I almost failed. So that wasn't great. Um, I decided that I was going to change my major to biochem because I really liked biology as well. So I decided that I was going to try that out. And I was also um, exploring a major that we have at Rice called Cognitive Sciences, which is kind of a mixture between neuroscience and psychology. So I was interested in sociology and psychology as well, since I took those my freshman year in college. So I was kind of playing around with the idea um, of doing, uh, you know, a biochem major versus, you know, this kind of more like social science-y, like um, more like fun sounding major with more diversity. So I kind of played with that idea sophomore year when I decided which classes I wanted to take. And the issue with that was because we have to declare our majors by the end of sophomore year. So my sophomore year ended up being pretty difficult because I had to take a bunch of classes. So I was like pretty much on the full credit load um, both semesters of my sophomore year. Um, just because, you know, I had to figure out what major I was going to be in. I had to take all the prerequisites for the upper level courses that I was going to be taking for the next two years. Um, so it was a little bit difficult for me then. I was a little bit stressed out as well, you know, thinking about um, what classes I needed to get done before taking my MCAT and deciding that as well as like uh, trying to pick out my major as well. So that was a little stressful for me during undergrad. Um, but I eventually figured it out, decided that, you know, I wanted to go more of the hard science track, which I think really helped me out in med school, as Abner was saying. Um, biochem in med school, I think, has been easier than undergraduate biochemistry. So for all of you guys who are struggling through biochem like I was my sophomore and junior years, it's totally yeah. worth it. Um, learn it now. It's much, yes. well, not much easier. It's <laughs> easier in med school. You just learn it in a shorter period of time but you go less in depth. So if you learn it once, learn it um, well the first time, you'll be totally fine for biochem in med school. I want her to say that one more time loudly because I did it well the first time. And I spent most of Friday ugly crying when I learned that I actually did pass biochem in med school. So don't be like me, be more like Adriana, get it right the first time so that you're not in my shoes. Absolutely, I agree with them. Um, Taking biochem and immunology for me totally changed the game in med school. It was really something that I said, like, wow, I'm so glad that I took those when I did because they really helped.
Absolutely. And I, I just have to echo this myself, not just only for medical school, but also uh, strictly speaking from a, from a perspective as an MCAT instructor who's been doing this for, for far too long. Uh, I see so many students who come into the MCAT classroom who crammed on organic chemistry, crammed on, on, or, on biochemistry and worked their way through it and got the grade, but then they effectively have to relearn it for the MCAT itself. So exactly. I, I hear absolutely what you're saying. Learn it, learn it best the first time around, and then you'll save yourself a lot of time down working through it. Excellent. Uh, in that vein, actually, we've got a great question coming in. And I, wanna, I do want to get some of the questions that the students are submitting to us. Uh, Heidi's asking, can you share any of your must-take undergrad electives that would be most beneficial, uh, not just for the admissions process, but also for, uh, for grad school, excuse me, for medical school itself? So it sounds like biochemistry is one. What are some of the other great classes that you all took as undergrads? So I definitely echo um, the immunology. I also took immunology as one of my biochem electives and it was really helpful. Um, I haven't taken immunology in med school yet since that's a second year class, but it was super helpful for the MCAT because the MCAT really emphasizes immunology. Um, another one that I would say is really helpful is just like an intro neuroscience class since the, um, the MCAT also really tests the nervous system. Um, and we actually at Maryland have like a dedicated block to neuroscience. So it really helps for you to get your feet a little bit wet before you really dive into, you know, the complex structure of the brain and the nervous system and the functions and all that. There's also um, the cell bio class. Um, since my major was in um, molecular biology, that was one of my record sites. But um, it's very, it, it's, it's like an introduction to what histology is gonna be in your first year of medical school. So I think that one really helped me as well, but I wouldn't say it's a must take, but if you can take it, then I would recommend that too. And to completely change directions of where this train is going, um, these women with me are so totally right. I wish I had taken all of these courses that I'm taking now in medical school, but at the same time, being someone who studied evolutionary anthropology, I think it's been really helpful with my different major and my different background. The fact that I was taking those anthro courses, I was doing a lot of writing uh, because something I see in my classmates that's a bit of a weakness is they're not able to write, communicate effectively in writing, and they have a harder time understanding things like social determinants of health and relating to people on a human to human level. So while you know the classroom stuff is so, so important and that's what gets you there and that's what gets you your degree and that MD at the end of the day, it's definitely still important to remember to be a human being because you're a human treating humans. Absolutely. Yeah, I think those are all, all phenomenal points. I know that one, one class that many of my students have said that they enjoyed taking was, uh, was actually a biomedical ethics class as well, that it serves some of those same, some, some, some of those same points, I guess I would say. Okay. Uh, in the same vein, then we have another question here uh, uh, regarding retaking prerequisite courses. Do you think it would be a better route to, uh, to do an informal method of retaking those classes at a local university perhaps, or a more formal post-baccalaureate uh, program. So Danielle, since you had the most experience, it sounds like with retaking some classes, maybe you'd like to start us off on this one. Definitely, I have a lot of friends who did formal post-baccalaureate programs that did very, very well in them, and it did help their acceptance to medical school. It was not something I could afford. It was not something in my wildest dreams that I could afford. Um, so I took, retook physics two at a community college after I graduated because I had some scholarships and a local competition to pay for that. And I retook biochemistry actually during undergrad while I was prepping for the MCAT because it was already covered with my scholarships there. So if you're in a place in your life where you have the time, the just ability to spend a year or two doing a special master's or a post back program, and of course the money to finance and you're willing to take on that burden, a post back is such a great experience. But for someone like me, as long as you can explain to schools, look, this is where I was in my life and that wasn't mm -hmm. something I could take on. In my experience, if you can convey that story to them, they are understanding of it. Adriana or Abner, anything to, to add there? Um, I, I don't have experience with it. But I do know of some people that do. And as she was saying, it's all about like selling yourself in that interview and saying, oh, yeah, I took this year. But look at all the things that I did and um, look at this research, look at this like publication. It's really all about, you know, um, getting the best out of it and showing them that you used that year efficiently and you didn't like waste time. 
totally agree with um, both Admiris and Danielle. I also didn't end up retaking any courses, um, but I do have friends who did. And I, I know that, you know, doing a formal post back is definitely a great experience, like Danielle said, but you really need to be like in the right place. You have to decide that you want to commit that year um, and that you don't want to be, you know, like actively applying to schools with that time and that you're okay with pushing back. Um, you're, you know, you're starting medical school for another year while you do that post-bac program. So it's really all about, you know, like your financial situation, where you are in life and your timeline of uh, becoming a doctor and going to medical school. And another quick plug is I actually wrote an ebook with Kaplan on the med school admissions process. And I, we have, I think three chapters total on gap years and post-bac programs. So if you just tweet to us at the Kaplan MCAT prep Twitter, myself as Danielle, the intern can tweet you that link if you're curious to read more about it. Excellent. It's a great, great additional resource we can point students towards, since I know there are a lot of questions about post back programs. Okay, well, let's keep the conversation moving. I know that a lot of students are already starting to see questions about the MCATs. So let's talk a little bit about what the prep experience was like for the MCAT, and when specifically did you start that studying? I think that's a big question for a lot of students, when to, when to really engage with the test itself. Uh, so Abner, if you wouldn't mind starting us off there. Yeah, um, so I chose to do my uh, dedicated study time in the summer. So I actually took my MCAT on um, the, the second week of August. And honestly, that's what I recommend for everyone because I have seen people um, prepping for it during school time. And it's just, I mean, it's a lot to handle. So um, I really don't regret taking that summer and I fully 100% dedicated myself to just taking my Kaplan course and um, studying in, in home. And I, yeah, I don't regret doing that. So I do absolutely recommend that to everyone who has the time. So I want to follow up on that for a second, Abners. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you took the, the, the MCAT over the summer and waited until August to take that. So how did that influence your applications as well? I know that's a question that a lot of students have in regards to the test. Well, I kind of did a crazy thing that people still um, like open their mouth and their eyes when they, they hear that. I took my MCAT on my second year of college. Like the summer, I know. <laughs> That's and Danielle just happened. made that face. <laughs> An example. <laughs> um, yes, I did that um, because I took the old MCAT. So I finished all of my courses uh, that were coming on the test on that second year. So I said, this is as fresh as I will ever have this in my head. And for example, I had just finished organic chem and I had just finished physics. So I actually didn't have to study as hard for those because I had just, you know, I was just done with them. And so that was really a super wise choice. I said, if I don't pass it, then I'll take it again. It's okay. But then I passed it. So it was amazing. And I didn't have to think of the MCAT ever again. And I think that was probably a very wise decision, it sounds like, because you, like you said, you had that knowledge fresh in your mind, just like we were talking about, you learned it once and then didn't have to bother with relearning it later exactly. when you were studying the test. And the thing that I love about that scenario is actually that you, uh, that you were able to then dedicate effectively your entire third year, your entire junior year to the rest of the application process. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Adriana, how about you? How did your prep begin? Yeah, so I kind of did something similar. Um, well, almost exactly the same, I guess. So I actually <laughs> took it second week of August as well after my second year of college. Um, and I guess going into it, I, I didn't really know when people um, typically took the MCAT until actually I took my Kaplan prep course and I realized that everyone else was like a junior. And so I, I thought that was like out of the ordinary because I had no idea. Um, I was kind of just doing what everyone else at Rice did. So like, Kind of on that line, I think talking to upperclassmen at your school is like super helpful because the process is really confusing. There's a lot of different moving pieces that you have to get at kind of like exactly the right time in order to be, you know, the best applicant that you can be. So talking to people who've already gone through the process, who like recently just took their MCAT or recently just filed applications is going to be really helpful in helping you to decide your timeline. So with that being said, um, I knew that I wanted to go straight into medical school right after college. I didn't want to take a gap year or anything. I just 
you know, like wanted to get started as soon as possible. I was so excited. <laughs> so, um, so I decided to take it um, the summer after sophomore year for that reason. So I could have all of my junior year in order to turn in my application. I didn't have to worry about, you know, like taking my MCAT, sitting for that, and then like immediately turning around and writing my personal statement, you know, and then immediately having to do secondaries and interviews like all in a row. So I wanted to have that break um, between my MCAT and, and even have an opportunity to retake it if I needed to. Um, if you are thinking of applying uh, after, so like if, you, if you're thinking of taking a gap year, then you have a little bit more flexibility. Taking it that early if you're taking a gap year might not necessarily be a good idea because some schools won't take a score that's too old. So you definitely kind of want to figure out when you want to go to med school, when you're going to be applying, and then kind of count backwards from there to figure out when you want to take your MCAT. Um, so I actually started prepping in May. So pretty much right after finals, end, finals ended uh, sophomore year, I took kind of like two weeks off, did a little vacation thing, and then I started studying for my MCAT right away. So I did three months of um, pretty much dedicated time. Uh, I was actually also doing research during the summer. Um, but that was like, my PI was pretty chill and that I could, you know, kind of like study for the MCAT while I was running gels and stuff. Like I didn't have to be doing research while I was in the lab, like 24 seven. Um, so I could kind of study for my MCAT a little bit during the lab while I was doing my research. And then I would go home at night and take the Kaplan course and then, you know, do all my homework and stuff then. Um, so my course ended, I think I want to say beginning or like mid June ish. So then I had about a month and a half with the research um, to do my own self studying. And the reason why I gave myself a month and a half, like a little bit longer than Kaplan actually recommends is because I knew that I was going to be doing the research and I knew that I would fall behind and I did. So it was a good idea for me to kind of give myself a little bit extra time before my test so that I knew I could get um, all of the practice tests that I wanted to get in, get in all of the practice questions and feel confident on my MCAT before test day. And I think that that's a really, really great point. I often find in my classes that students come in expecting to wrap up the class and then maybe a week later take the actual MCAT. And that's that's not a great way to go because we're still learning content up until the very end of the program. Uh, so having having at least three to five weeks is what I usually recommend to students to, to do exactly what you're talking about. More full lengths, fine-tuned, uh, focused prep is a great way to go. And clearly it worked for you. Mm -hmm. Danielle, yeah, how much you? It worked out. So like Adriana said, um, I played a lot off of what my peers were doing and my older brother is actually a year older than me and he was applying to med school the year before me. So I thought I'll just do what big brother's doing. So I, I initially, initially did not plan on taking a gap year. My plan was to go straight out of undergrad. So my plan was to start prepping in January, uh, take an MCAT course with Kaplan and then take the test in May and then immediately turn around and start cranking out these applications. Halfway through my MCAT prep, I realized that I was indeed taking a gap year and I would not be applying that year. So it kind of took that burden of quick turnaround off and I was actually, at the end of the day, very thankful for it because I didn't you know, have to worry about being burnt out at the end of the process. So I, unlike my other two panelists, was actually still in school. It was not summer. I was in my winter semester. But the one thing I did do was drop down to part-time um, because it is a boatload of work. And when people say it's a full-time job, they're really not joking. So I, I wasn't, because of scholarships and how life works and school works, I wasn't able to completely take that semester off. But I took not quite the bare minimum, but as few classes as I possibly could. The one thing I did do though was um, I knew I would struggle with biochem, as we have seen, and I knew I would struggle with physics, too, on the MCAT. So I made sure I was taking those as I was prepping, so I was hitting my weaknesses twice. So once during my self-study with my course, and then once again in the actual classes I was taking. So I think doubling up, kind of like my previous uh, panelists have said, was beneficial at the end. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge that the three of you had sort of different timelines that you were studying on, but it all seems to have coalesced around the same general general experience for getting ready for, for the exam. So Adriana, you were saying you, you really did it on a bit more of a condensed timeline, but it was basically all you were doing except for the research. Danielle, you took a little bit longer, it sounds like, to get ready for the test, but you spread things out a little bit more. And I think that's that's very very emblematic of what we see with a lot of students. The important thing, I think, is that when you give yourself 
more time than you think you're going to need because inevitably you fall behind in studying for the test. I've never, I've had lots of students complain about not having enough time to, to get ready for the test, but I've never had a student complain about having too much time to study. For the test. <laughs> Digging a little bit deeper here on the MCAT, we've got some great questions coming in. Uh, I see one from Valerie here. Uh, would you say that grades are all that mattered when it comes to getting into med school? Uh, or would you say that not having a great GPA still makes it possible if you make up for it, say, with an MCAT score? So I'm curious what, what you all have seen in your own experiences and perhaps also what you've seen from your, uh, from your peers uh, in medical school itself, some of their stories, if you know. I think you can see um, stories of both. So I have friends of friends with very low GPAs, very high MCAT scores, or the opposite get into medical school. Myself personally, I like to say that my non-science GPA was fine. My science GPA was a tragedy, and my MCAT score was pretty solid on the upper end of pretty good. Uh, and I, I don't like telling people that one thing makes up for the other because I don't think that's a good trap to fall into because then you're excusing, you know, your shortcomings and you're excusing the fact that you didn't do as well on something, you know, it's in the past, it's a bummer, but it's not a thing that you can just make up for with something else and schools are looking at you holistically. So, you know, it's important to see where your weaknesses are and try to capitalize on your strengths while you're still fixing those weaknesses. So like myself, I knew that, you know, again, biochemistry was not my strong suit. I took it again to show the schools that I could do it. And then on the MCAT, out of all my science scores, my biochem score was actually the highest. So I was actively fighting to show them, look, I know I screwed up, but look at me getting better. Another thing schools will tell you is that they want to see upward trends in your GPA. So while you know your GPA not, might not be the best, as long as they see something going up, that means that you're improving and they see that as a positive. Absolutely. I agree with Danielle. And um, I think that the MCAT and the GPA kind of have the same weight um, on your application. So as she was saying, um, one is not going to save you from the other. But you, I mean, I know people that don't have, like, for example, I have a friend with a 3.6 um, who got a great score on his MCAT and he's in my class. And then, of course, you have people with like 4.0 GPAs who are not too good at standardized tests and got, um, you know, an average score and they made it as well. So, I mean, it really depends on how low your GPA is and, you know, but it also depends on what schools you're applying to because, I mean, schools are very, very um, different um, in what they are looking for. So, of course, if you have like a very low GPA, then um, you have to know what you're aiming for in terms of the medical schools you're applying to. Good advice. Adriana, what's been your experience? I know you've come from a little bit more of a, a traditional pre-med route. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that everything that Abner and Danielle said uh, are definitely true. I wouldn't, you know, try to explain or try to make up for a, a loss in your GPA with like a, a really good MCAT score. Like they really aren't the same. Um, they're considered with similar weights on the application, um, but you know, as Abner said, they're not the same thing. So you can't really equate them. Another thing that I'd like to bring up though is having um, really great extracurriculars and clinical experiences. So your personal statement is kind of all about your clinical experiences and your application as well is kind of about like what you did, what makes you you and what makes you a good fit for whatever school you're applying to. So of course there are gonna be some schools um, that, you know, there's like, there's just so many applicants and so little spots that they just have to skim off the top, right? Like there's some schools where if you don't have the numbers, then they just won't even look at your application. But most of the schools in the country aren't like that. So for most of the schools in the country, they're going to look at your application. They're going to look at what kinds of extracurriculars you did. If you know you had really great leadership roles, you had a really good clinical experience that shows that you are dedicated to being a doctor and that you will stay in medical school no matter what. You're a fighter. Um, if you have experiences like that, that can sometimes, you know, kind of put you above the rest, even though even if you have um, not a great GPA or not a great MCAT or not great both. Um, so I think it's really important to be kind of a holistic applicant, as Danielle said, um, to make sure that, you know, you're, you're focusing on your strengths and you're highlighting those um, and being able to explain your weaknesses, but kind of not focusing on them. 
Absolutely. I think that's a phenomenal point. And, and it's, a, it's one that's really, really well taken here because so many schools have adapted or adopted, I should say, the holistic review process, which is a formal process that the Association of American Medical Colleges recommends. Yes. Um, I also just want to throw in a, a quick plug. A little bit later on this spring, we will actually be doing another admissions focused event called our annual Medical School Insider Event. We'll all be sitting down with, uh, with deans of admissions to discuss many of these same questions. And you can hear it from their perspective as the people making the, the decisions about applicants. Uh, so for students who are interested in hearing that side of the conversation, certainly keep an eye on our social media, keep an eye out for that event. Again, it's called the Medical School Insider Event, uh, and it should be coming up uh, a little bit later on this spring. Uh, for now, I want to return the conversation, though, to your own personal experiences, because I know that's what a lot of the students tonight want to hear, hear about. So what do you think made the difference in your MCAT studies? I know all of you said that you actually studied with Kaplan. You took a, a formal Kaplan course to get ready for the test, but were there specific resources or specific tools that you really took advantage of that you think helped you get over the hump and achieve a great score that obviously got you into medical school. Hey, Jonathan, we can start with you there. Oh. No worries. Okay, so um, I think that the thing that helped me the most was actually taking full length practice tests. But okay, so take that with a grain of salt, right? Because you don't want to start taking full length practice tests like day one. You definitely don't want to do that because you know you need to build up your content knowledge. You need to learn the strategy, which, which Kaplan is great at doing. Um, I will say that I was a strategy non-believer when I first started uh, the Kaplan course. And then by the end, I was like, man, I'm using elimination like everywhere. Like this is how all standardized tests should be taken. Like this is the greatest thing ever. Um, so definitely like if you're uh, taking a Kaplan course, if you're prepping with Kaplan, um, you know, like buy into the strategy, buy into what we're teaching you because, you know, it's worked for so many students and that's why we're still doing this. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that during my time um, after the class was over, so for that one and a half ish month period where I wasn't taking the course, using the question bank and kind of brushing up on um, my weaknesses. So I was pretty bad at physics. Um, so kind of doing like physics questions and cars questions uh, every day was really, really helpful for me. Um, and then after that, doing one full length each week and, you know, being really strict about when I was doing that full length. So I knew that I was going to be taking my test at 8 a.m. Um, so I would, you know, wake up every Saturday um, at the same time that I would wake up to go to my test center. I would go to the library and I would just sit down and take the test for like the entire day. And then I would come home, um, take a break on that Saturday and then review, um, you know, go over my tests, review my mistakes, review what I did well, what I did poorly on Sunday. And that would be kind of like my, my weekend routine, I guess, um, for the second half of the summer. So that was definitely really helpful because by the time that I got to the test, I knew exactly what to expect. I knew that I wasn't going to be like super tired or, you know, like really anxious or more anxious than I would be taking a big test. Um, but I, I knew that I wasn't going to be like off my game because I had done it like six or seven times already. So I think that, you know, kind of putting yourself in the test taking experience and making sure that you know exactly what to expect, you know exactly what's going to happen on test day so that you can, you know, control as many variables as you possibly can was really helpful to like calm me down and make sure that I could focus on the content and focus on the strategy. Um, so talking about my experience, something that I really learned with Kaplan was to not second out my choices. Um, Kaplan has this feature where they tell you like out of the 10 answers you chose and changed, you had them correct and then you, um, you got them wrong or you got them wrong initially and then you fixed them. So I really learned from Kaplan how to like attack questions. And I think that's a very, very important thing because it's actually helped me um, on my medical school exams as well, because it's a very similar style of question where um, they're not directly asking you what they want to know, but they want you to think like one, two or three steps above that. So it's really, really important to practice, but then it's important not to practice too much um, because it kind of burns you out. So as Adriana was saying, I actually had my Saturday routine as well. And I would literally um, wake up two hours before, make some breakfast. Um, I would take this, the test as seriously as I could. 
Um, so I kind of like the nerve factor is absolutely, um, you know, terrifying because on test day you are super nervous. You're probably not thinking as, as, you know, as straight as you usually do. Um, and there's so much happening. I mean, you're at a different place. You don't know anyone. It's kind of terrifying. So having taken a test before that really helps to um, say, okay, I've done this before. Um, I know what to do. I'm just gonna, um, you know, answer the questions as, as directly as I can and not think about my nerves or any other stuff going on. I love hearing about my uh, fellow panelists talking about their their practice strategy because in sports they're always told you know perfect practice makes perfect so remove all variables possible practice the same way every single time um, and that really helped I think the three of us with our success the biggest game changer for me not only was prepping for the MCAT but in every single test I've taken afterwards was Kaplan's test taking strategy so not quite Adriana's level of being a strategy non-believer um, but I, just, I thought it was a little cheesy and I didn't think it could possibly be that novel and I was a little more ambivalent towards it. Um, but something that, you know, I tell my kind of mentees coming out of my current, um, my, my undergraduate university is the fact that you're smart, your school is preparing you well, you're learning all the content in your courses and you're smart and you're capable. So everything is either in your brain or kind of like in your brain's back file cabinet just needs to be dusted off while you're studying. But the thing that you don't know yet is the test. So you don't know how the test takers are writing their questions. You don't know the like typical wrenches that they try to throw at you. You don't know, you know how to read beyond their words to see what they really mean. And um, like Abneris was saying, the second or third order questions where they ask a question about one thing, which means you need to have information in your head about another thing, which means you need to have information in your head about another thing. You see that on the MCAT and you see it in medical school all the time, but it's something you don't get a lot of during undergrad. So getting used to knowing the MCAT and learning more about the MCAT than I was actually learning more about the material sometimes it felt like was huge on test day because I felt like I was always one step ahead of the test takers. Absolutely. And also part of our strategy that Kaplan teaches in the courses is how to save time I've, I've never been um, like a test taker changer. Like I don't really change my answers, uh, but everyone can be more efficient. You know, I've always been a fast test taker, but everyone can be more efficient. Fast isn't always good. So, you know, learning ways to be quick, but still accurate. And that's something that has carried me through so many exams. I remember the first regular college exam I took after the MCAT it felt like I was on another planet. I was another person with a superhuman brain who was capable of like doing computer calculations in my head because I felt so confident in my test taking abilities. So every standardized exam that I go into now, like even last week we had four shelf exams over the span of two days. It was really unpleasant, but I wasn't nervous because even though you know I didn't feel 100% in the material, I trusted my ability to take the test and to be as smart, if not smarter than the test. So that was that was the absolute game changer for me. That's why I applied to work for Kaplan and that's why I don't think I'm ever gonna leave you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I think well, that what Daniel said about the test is um, definitely true. It's kind of like when you're taking the MCAT and for me in like medical school too, um, just as you, you ladies said earlier, like, it's almost like, it's like an inside joke with whoever wrote the test. It's like, ha, I see that trick on that question. Like you didn't Definitely. get me. Ha -ha. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a really great point that a lot of students who first start out studying for the test and maybe even try, try studying for the test on their own often miss. And it's hard. And I know Petros, who, who did the personal statement workshop last night, I believe, uh, just says this all the time as well. And it's hard. The test is not actually a science test. It's really a, it's a test about your, your reasoning skills in many exactly. cases. Still have to lo know a lot of science for it, though. So were there any tricks that the three of you used to, to get that science down or to, to get over areas of science that you uh, felt weren't your strongest areas in particular? Something that was essential for me was meeting with a learning specialist at school. Um, I think it was through my academic advisor, she got me in contact with our university's learning specialist, or if your school doesn't have one, I'm sure your advisor can give you something similar, where uh, before med school, I had always been, or before undergrad college, I'd always been an auditory learner. So if I heard it once, I was going to remember it. 
And that changed during undergrad. I don't know if it was my brain or the courses or what, but all of a sudden I was floundering on all my courses. I didn't know why. So she gave me this little quiz and it told me that I was now a tactile kinesthetic learner. So something that worked for me was not only making flashcards for, you know, space repetition, but moving those flashcards around. So I would be up moving or I'd be moving my hands or I'd make little matching games. So that way the just brute force memorization things like physics formulas or amino acids and biochem, I, I was learning it in the best way possible because sitting down and reading 99% of the time isn't the best way for us to be learning. So I really recommend that everybody go out and learn that there's, someone watching this right now who was actually in one of my chemistry study groups in undergrad that I facilitated. And I know I told this every single, like every week, you know, take a quiz, find out what type of learner you are, because you can spend years trying to learn something and then, you know, learn it in a week because you weren't learning it the right way. That gets a great point. Hey, Johnny, look at you have something to add. Yeah. So I, for me, um, I think I'm also like mostly a tactile kinesthetic learner. So I really like doing practice questions and like writing things out. So like if A, so my favorite things to do are like pathways. So I love doing like if A happens, then like B will also happen and only inhibit C or whatever. So I really like like using scratch paper and like writing stuff down and stuff. So that was something that I wanted to practice before test day because the test is on the computer and you can't like write on the questions. So that was something that really helped me in terms of like learning how to take the test and also learning the material because like every time I ran into a problem um, in like the cube bank or something where I would need to use the formula I would write it down once so you know doing like 12 of those questions I would write that formula down 12 times and that means that my hand would probably start hurting um, and that I definitely remember that formula um, so that was really helpful for me to be doing the um, doing the practice questions and making sure that you know I like wrote down all the information that I knew about each of those questions and that if I got it wrong um, I also made a note of it so that I could go back and look at it later but um, overall, like, I think reading things first usually helps me. So, um, you know, kind of listening to it first and then reading the book. So like reading it in the review book or something like that, and then watching a video again, and then going to do the questions. So kind of getting all like auditory, visual and um, tactile kinesthetic stuff, um, doing all of it, uh, you know, doing all of it once, at least once for each kind of material really helps me to solidify because I was able to be like, okay, I remember hearing it like this. I remember that it was on like the left side of the book in this little box over here. And then I also remember writing down the formula that one time that I had like number five and I got it wrong. So that really helped me because if I forgot one thing, I could always go back to like a different mode of learning where I did remember like a tidbit um, of what I did. It's a great way to tie everything together, I think, as well, just to see to see the material from different perspectives. That's one of the hallmarks of the test. You're going to see things that you know from ways in ways that you've never never imagined it being presented before. Mm -hmm. Right. Abner, how about you? And also, if you could add to it, I see we've got a couple of great questions here about motivation for studying as well. So, if you want to talk a little bit about that, in addition to any any study tricks you've got, that would be wonderful. Okay. So, um, my trick was basically. Um, to do questions before I was ready for them. And I know that it's not something that most people do, um, but for some reason, I always remember the stuff I get wrong more than the stuff that I get right. It's super weird, but I'm like, in a test, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the one I got wrong from the question from da, 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 da. So I actually remember that. And so I start doing questions, like for example, uh, on, on subjects that I don't really like I have trouble remembering um, even before studying that material. So then when I'm actually studying the material, I'm like, oh yeah, I saw this in that question that I got wrong. Um, so, and yeah, about motivation, um, it's a very hard thing because we all go through that, like, why am I doing this? Um, I'm reading from books and all I want to do is treat patients. And I actually struggle with that in med school as well because med school you know the first two years are actually reading books again um i just i really try to look forward um and think about what i'm aiming for because we're not here for the books we're not here for you know bottling up every piece of information in the world um we're here because we want to treat patients because we want to help um people that are in need um we want to be the doctors that we would want our families to be treated with. So I, I, I really try to think ahead because thinking about the now and the 
and the books and the studying, it just, it takes a toll on you. So I really recommend, um, you know, setting your goals and thinking like I'm doing this for a specific reason and just always stay focused on that. I think that's a great point. It's one that often gets lost in, as you're mm-hmm. focused so much on, on the MCAT scores and whether or not you're getting questions right. It's easy to lose, lose sight of the bigger picture. This is something mm-hmm. that, that students really want. This is all about becoming a physician and helping the patients at the end of the day. Uh, and Adriana and Danielle, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this motivation piece as well. I want to bring in a question we just got as well uh, about uh, what would you say to those who don't know where to start studying for the MCAT? Because it can be a very overwhelming whelming, uh, excuse me, overwhelming process just to, to figure out what to do first. So what are your thoughts on that matter and how do we mo- maintain then day-to-day motivation? For me, day-to-day motivation um, is all about finding your why. And I think finding your why is so important because Abneris just said, you know, you have those days where you're like, why am I doing this? But if you have the answer, then you can give yourself that answer and keep pushing on. And it's important because your why is what your personal statement's about. It's what your entire interview is going to be about. So, you know, there was something scary that happened to me during my Kaplan MCAT course. So our instructor had everybody in the room share why they wanted to go to med school and why they wanted to be a doctor. And I was honest to goodness, the only person in the room with a solid answer. And it was really frightening um, because I was worried about you know, my own narcissism apparently, but also, you know, my colleagues and the fact that, you know, they have to work so hard. There's so much that's going to come at you. And, you know, there's so much that you have to fight for in this profession. And if you don't have like a, just a deep, soulful connection to why you're doing it, it's really, really difficult to do anything. So I always Mm -hmm. tell my friends and the people I'm mentoring, do a lot of soul searching. You know, I found my why personally um, through doing a lot of clinical experience and working with the elderly because I want to do geriatric primary care. So I spent a lot of time working in home care and that's what gave me my why. So every time I was crying about biochemistry again, I was able to think about the patients I was serving every day. Um, In terms of where to start, I think Adriana probably has the best answer because what I tell people is to make a study plan and a study schedule. So print out an actual calendar. And this is something I learned in my course. So she's probably an expert, but print out a calendar and write down each chapter you're doing and each questions you're doing that way. So it's not, you know, your seven page or your seven book set you're looking at. It's just Mm -hmm. a couple chapters and a couple questions a day. And you just have to take care of today. And then you can worry about tomorrow when it's tomorrow. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Taking it one one bite at a time. It's the old uh, how do you eat an elephant problem. Um, I would also add uh, my own view on that. Just about the very first thing students should do if they haven't already, take a practice test. Even though that seems like the scariest thing in the world, just go ahead and dive on it. As, as Abner said, it's it's good to start in with questions earlier than you think you need to because it gives you a lot of data actually about what the test is actually asking you. Adriana, how about your thoughts? Yeah, so I kind of want to echo what you just said, Owen, um, about taking a practice test and diving in. So we kind of have something similar here at um, University of Maryland. Um, Basically, I think like two or three days after our last test second year, our school just offers an opportunity for you to just like take step one, um, like a practice step one test. And like, of course, no one's ready. No one's going to study for it because you literally have like one day after your last final Um, So it's like a really good kind of like wake up call to be like, okay, hey, you're starting out here and you need to be there, like way over there. Um, So you need to get started. And that was kind of my wake up call as well when studying for the MCAT. So I went ahead and took a diagnostic as my, you know, I signed up for the Kaplan course. I was like, I'm going to do it this summer. Um, But I kind of didn't know where to start either. My friends told me, you know, you want to dedicate maybe like three months over the summer if that's all you're doing. So I did but I didn't know like what to do specifically. Um, so, you know, I took the diagnostic and I was like, okay, well, you know, that was not great. Um, that's not where I want to be right now, which is totally fine. Um, but that kind of gave me a wake up call and I was like, okay, so I need to do, um, you know, I need to review all of this content. I need to learn how to take the test. I need to go to this class. And then um, like Danielle said, I also made a calendar. So one thing that's really nice is that a lot of instructors at Kaplan will actually review your um, your calendar for you. So if you make like a study plan for each week um, with, you know, when you're going to study, what you're going to do, um, Kaplan instructors will actually give you feedback on your um, on your study plan. What looks good, what doesn't look good, what you might need to change, um, how to make that study plan as well. 
So that can be really helpful in learning how to plan for your MCAT, as well as learning how to manage your time for the rest of college and for med school as well. So I know that like after I took my MCAT, I was a total like calendar junkie. Like I, I live on my calendar. I cannot live without my calendar. <laughs> I literally would be in shambles. So like, I think that, you know, being able to have a plan and knowing exactly what you want to do at exactly, you know, whatever time and sticking to that plan is really important, especially when you're going to be studying for this huge test over a like huge number of months or a huge amount of time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Great, great points all around. And then just while we're on the subject, uh, somewhat coincidentally, we do actually have a free practice test event for the MCAT coming up this weekend on Saturday. Uh, so please feel free to take a look at the Kathleen website, captest.com, uh, and look under MCAT if you're interested in taking a practice test event for that. I believe the, uh, the uh, off-camera teachers will also be sharing that link or at least uh, some directions on finding that event. Uh, So continue right along. Uh, We are coming up rapidly on the one hour mark. I can't believe we're already about halfway through, Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and start shifting gears from the academic aspects that we've been talking about so far and uh, and start engaging with some of the, maybe we think of it as the more fun stuff when it comes to being a pre-med, starting with some of the clinical and research and extracurricular activities that you all participated in. So let's let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, I know one big question a lot of students often have uh, when it comes to extracurricular activities is, how do you find them? How do you first get introduced and get into a lab or start volunteering at a hospital or shadowing someone? What did each of you do? Abner, maybe you can start things off for us. Sure. Um, So I think the most important thing, especially for like finding research is asking around. People are afraid to do that. And I was afraid to do that myself, but I had a few friends that I knew were doing research So I ask around, you know, how did you get here? Who did you communicate with? Who should I email? And it's really like starting out is horrible because you have to email like 30 people and only like two may reply. And then one is full. So you're stuck with the other one. And it's probably not something that you like as much. Um, But the good thing is that if you start doing research early on and if you don't, and you don't really like it that much, you can always change to another research. Um, you don't have to stay in the same research for your, you know, full college years. Um, so I would say um, research is super duper important. So now that we're touching that, um, it's at least in the schools that I apply to, it's kind of a non-requisite requisite. It's a non-spoken thing, but it actually is required. Um, So that's something that um, is really growing in the medical community. Um, So even for residency, we're already being fired up on doing research. So it's really something important that you should start in your college years that I totally recommend doing. And about community service and volunteering, I actually went myself with some friends to a nearby hospital and we said we want to volunteer. What can we do? Um, and started off like that. It's really just a direct approach and communicating what you want to do. And there's always going to be people who need help and want help. Um, So reach out to your community, anyone you know that might need help. Absolutely. The the big takeaway there is the first first step is just to ask. Start asking around, make it known that you want to do something and, and see where things go from there. So I had a similar experience with research. So I wanted to start research um, the summer after my freshman year. So uh, uh, let's see, I guess in the winter. So over winter break, um, I basically just like emailed 100 people. Like, I'm not even joking. I emailed so many people. Um, So I basically just, you know, looked up um, all the places in the area. So like, um, I my my family lives in Maryland, um, around Rockville. So I kind of uh, just looked at like all the DC schools, all the Maryland schools, like NIH, like everything. And I just sent emails to like everyone that I was possibly interested in working with, which was a lot of people because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So um, I ended up doing that. And luckily a couple people got back to me um, and I was able to uh, get um, a position at the NIH um, in an ophthalmology lab. Um, so I was able to do that. And I actually did that for two summers because I just, I really enjoyed the lab um, and I really enjoyed ophthalmology. Um, so I ended up doing that for two summers. So it was great because I was able to kind of like go back to school and then come back for their summer program since the NIH actually has a dedicated summer program. Um, in terms of doing like volunteer work and clinical experiences, um, a lot of schools will have um, like extracurricular fairs and stuff. Um, and I think 
like a lot of schools will also have research fairs as well. So actually, if you want to do research during the year at your undergrad university, um, it's pretty easy to just go to like a research fair um, if your school offers that as well. But in terms of the extracurriculars, um, when I first went to Rice, I knew that they had an EMS um, program. So basically, uh, it's like a student run um, we're on call 24 seven kind of thing. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, that is what I want to do. That's what I want to dedicate my like entire college career to. So I did. Um, I was also involved in the Rice Pre-Medical Society as well. Um, but most of my time was dedicated to the EMS um, squad on campus. So with that being said, um, I did a lot of things with EMS, but the kind of like drawback of doing that was that I didn't have a lot of volunteer experience. So um, working for EMS was like technically volunteer, but I was just kind of like working within my own school community. I wasn't really like doing anything outside of campus with that, um, besides like doing ride outs for training and stuff like that. So um, I ended up actually not having a lot of time to do a lot of other volunteer stuff since I did assume a leadership role in EMS and we had to be on like 24 hours at a time. So, you know, I didn't really have time to do um, you know, like off campus or abroad volunteering or something like that, that I actually wanted to do. So definitely, um, you know, be aware of what you're applying to and, you know, what you're getting yourself into. Just make sure that uh, if there's like something that you really want to do, make sure that it's actually, you know, that it's that it's worth your time and that you actually want to do that more than some other things, because you're definitely going to be like making sacrifices throughout your college career. And, you know, you just you can't do everything. So you got to pick and choose what you want to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Great point. And I do want to just circle back to one thing you mentioned. You said that when you when you got into the research at NIH, you were placed into an ophthalmology lab. Was that what you were intending for? Was that what you were looking for? Ophthalmology specifically? So, um, yeah, so it was kind of not really what I was looking for, but also what I was looking for at the same time. So it was an, um, I know it's really confusing, um, but it was an immunology lab um, that was uh, also a clinical ophthalmology, like it was an ophthalmology clinic. Um, that specialized in autoimmune uveitis. So I was interested in the immunology part, but then I found that I also really liked ophthalmology, so it worked out. Interesting, very interesting. Good. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Danielle, how about you? Who would mind telling us a little bit about your extracurriculars? So um, I'll touch on research because I didn't do very much of it. I um, got into research my freshman year of college through our undergrad research opportunity program, which a lot of schools had. Um, it was the program itself was a bit stifling. If I went to research in undergrad again, I would recommend to myself to just start emailing professors and doing networking that my co-panelists have been talking about. So you have a little more freedom. Uh, I learned really quickly research was not for me. I dragged myself through two semesters of it to give it a good college try and it never went back. Uh, I, I don't think for at least the schools I was applying to that it was required or even an unspoken requirement, but I did almost unconsciously filter the schools that I was applying to in my head on, you know, which ones were very research-based focused schools and which ones were not. Um, and I ended up at a school that you know, does not have a super, super big research focus. I still have classmates that do research, but it's not something big in my life or I think most students' lives at my school. So every school is different. Every pre-med is different. Um, another ebook plug, we have a whole chapter on it. And then we have another whole chapter on finding clinical experience. So most of my clinical experience was actually found through work. And I think a lot of us are in a position where we're at a, either a big, like a very big university with a university associated hospital, or we're in a college town where everything is basically run by that college and there's not much outside. And because of the strong pre-med communities that a lot of you guys have at your school, it's so oversaturated that it's very tough to find the, the um, volunteer and clinical opportunities that most people look to first. So at my undergrad institution, a lot of us would try to volunteer in the hospital. And one, they were just swamped with applications. So they weren't even considering new people. And two, because they were so swamped, they could be very picky with who they took. So you had like a one in a million chance of getting in. So um, ways to kind of work around that and ways that I worked around it, I got into home care. So not everybody or not every company requires you to have a SENA or a certified nurse's assistant certificate to work in home care or a nursing home. Some do, some don't. If you're going the not get a SENA route, I recommend that you start somewhere that will train you really well. I was really lucky to start out in a company that trained me 
as good as a lot of CINAs that are out there. Um, and even if you don't have a CINA, these places are excited by college students who are eager and willing to learn. Uh, so I think that's a great thing you can do. Also, if you have a slow semester or you have a summer off, you can look into other certifications, not just a CINA. You can get a phlebotomy certification. You can get a medical assistant certification. And not only can this help you, you know, get that clinical experience, it can help you make money, which is cool. But if you do end up taking a gap year, this is like a whole gap year job that you could have. And also, um, Something my baby sister does through my own recommendation was look at student employment pages that might be published by your university or even on like classified classified Facebook pages where people are posting, you know, want ads in Facebook or job postings because there are students with different needs like muscular dystrophy, other neuromuscular disorders that seek out a fellow student as an aid to help them get ready in the morning and at night and take them to and from class. So I really encourage people to think a little more broadly. So, you know, don't just apply at the hospital, look at all the other ways you can start getting that clinical work. In terms of volunteer experience, um, you can look into those same places. So a lot of nursing homes, you know, want people volunteering there and that's where I started. And through that, I actually found an organization called Music and Memory, which is an organization using iPods and personalized playlists to enrich lives of people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And I became a self-appointed um, spokesperson for music and memory uh, during college and especially during my gap year in my college town. So a lot of my volunteer hour, um, hours were, were focused on that and having one big project. So while it's not necessarily the best thing to have only one big project and one volunteer experience, if it fits into your whole narrative, and my whole narrative was I want to serve the geriatric population, it makes for really good um, interview content and really good personal statement content as well. So uh, I encourage people to kind of, you know, think outside the box because the box is lightly, likely oversaturated. And so kind of look beyond it to find your own why, find your own narrative and get those opportunities that haven't been goggled, gobbled up by the pre-meds in your community. I think that's a great tip. Yeah, often getting outside the box is, is a phenomenal way to go. And sometimes that, that even means making your own new box. I, I have a feeling Definitely. that Adriana with the, the, the student EMS group that you, you were part of, I have a feeling that was just started by some students who wanted to do uh, wanted to do a new experience, wanted some of that patient contact. Uh, so it's a, all very good tips all around. I do want to address one question that came in because I, I honestly, I get it in every single event like this that we run. And I, I have a feeling that we're going to get some, some varied responses from each of you on this one. What's the optimal number of shadowing hours or volunteer work hours or clinical or research hours <laughs> to get you into medical school? So Tell me about your own experiences. I think that's that's the focus we want to take here. How many hours did you put down in your application? Um, I I stuck to like an eight hour per week maximum. It's not a lot, but I was in the same lab for almost three years. So when you add that up, I was actually spending a lot of time there, and I was actually um, heading up like I they actually gave me like a leadership position. Um, in my last year and my own project to develop. Um, so I don't think there's a right amount of hours, just, you know, the right amount that, like, that lets you be an influence on that lab and do something unique. And if you can develop your own project, you maybe have to uh, spend more hours than you want to. Um, I did um, use my last summer and I traveled to um, MD Anderson to a research program and that was a full-time thing. So I absolutely recommend if you have like a free summer, it doesn't have to be that last one. It can be, you know, any summer um, and you want to travel. It's an amazing experience to travel and do research at the same time. And of, of course it's a full-time thing, but most of them have like a stipend. So you actually get paid for it. Um, and I totally recommend that it's a pretty cool experience and you always end up with like a poster or a publication if you're lucky. Um, so yeah, I didn't really spend more than eight hours per week during my college years. So for my research, um, I ended up doing research over the summer, right? So it was kind of like a full-time job because I also had a stipend. So they actually required 40 hours of work per week. 
Um, but that was over the summer. So, you know, it wasn't during the school year, which is a little different from Adventist's experience. Um, so I guess over two summers that I was there, um, you know, 40 hours a week, maybe like 10-ish weeks. So you can kind of do the math um, on how much time I spent on research. But that is absolutely not, you know, like you don't need to spend that much time on research if, as Danielle said, it doesn't really fit into your narrative. So you really want to consider what you want to, like how you want to come off as an applicant and you want to do things and, you know, um, shape your extracurriculars and your research activities kind of around um, your narrative. And I saw a question come in earlier about um, does clinical kind of hold more weight? Um, and my answer to that is that I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. You can do any kind of research in undergrad and it doesn't really matter. Um, even like for in medical school, like it doesn't really matter if you do clinical versus um, bench work. Um, so that's kind of really up to you and what you're interested in. In terms of volunteer hours, um, as I mentioned before with my EMS experience, it was kind of, it was kind of like in a weird place for me because I was, you know, I was like kind of employed, like I got paid for certain things, but other things were on a volunteer basis. And I ended up having to do um, five to six, 24 hour shifts per month. Um, and I did this, you know, I, I was an, um, an EMS squad captain for uh, like a year and a half. So um, with all of that time together, you know, it was like a lot of time volunteering, but I wasn't actually doing stuff the entire time. So I guess, for, for example, um, I could go to class uh, while I was on call. Um, I would just have to leave class if there was a, a medical emergency on campus. So for me, it was a little bit different. Um, my hours, I would say, were probably a little bit inflated. Um, but I did, you know, kind of like write in my application, like I, I explained what that experience was so that it wasn't just like a ridiculous number um, that was on my application. And Daniela, how about you? I, I couldn't remember numbers off the top of my head. My application's printed out just across the room, but I don't think the number itself is super <clears throat> important. Um, you know, this isn't PA school where you're required to have a certain number of contact hours. It, it varies school by school. Maybe there is some med school out there that does require a certain amount of volunteer and clinical hours and Owen's shaking his head no. So it, I think, you know, Amir said it the best. It, it's however much it takes to, you know, light that fire in you and to keep that fire going. So, um, you know, my clinical experience hours were probably also inflated because I had to work basically full time to get myself through school to, you know, pay rent and all of that. So out of necessity, I was working 40 plus hours a week, like clinical experience. Uh, so, you know, I don't think tying a number to that is super essential, but it did fit, you know, my, my narrative and my experience and why I want to be a doctor and was the basis of a lot of my interviews and my entire personal statement. So however much I was working, however many contact hours I got, it was all worth it to me. The same with volunteering. You know, I tell people all the time, don't go out and do thousands of volunteer hours when you don't give a flying anything about the cause you're volunteering for. So I spent hundreds of hours with music and memory because I lived and breathed for it. And it was deeply, deeply important to me and my future career. So, you know, don't do anything that you're just doing to put on your resume because you're wasting your own time and you're wasting the person you're helping this time in all honesty. Do enough to figure out what your why is, what is getting you fired up and what keeps you going. And then, you know, find the one that keeps you going and keep going back. I think that's where you hit your sweet spot. I don't think the sweet spot's a number. I think it's more of a feeling and ties mm -hmm. back into the motivation of how to keep studying as well. Absolutely. 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 I think you're all revolving around the central point. And just, just to be clear, when I was shaking my head, it was because I, that you will never, in my experience, get a, a med school admissions officer to tell you a number on this point. And students always ask, but it is not a number kind of thing. If you're treating it like a checkbox, then you're kind of inherently doing it wrong already. Definitely. It really is about, about the experience that you gain. It's about how you grow in an individual. And in fact, when you look at the application, like the NCAS application, where you're describing these experiences, that's, that's what they're asking you for. For in your description? What did you learn from the experience? How did you grow? That's where your attention should be focused. And so. also like, um, you know, touching back on that question about um, lab-based research versus clinical, it's really something that you can point out in your interview because it doesn't only inflate your application, but for example, um, research was a huge part of my interview. 
because in my interview, I was actually doing both lab work and um, clinical work. Um, and I, I totally used that in my favor. I talked about um, how I could apply what I was doing in the lab to actual patients and I could see my future in that. And it really boosted not only my application, but my, like my goals and what I want to do with my career. And it really, really, really helped me in my interview. I, I mean, it doesn't have to be like, oh, I learned that I want to do research while doing research, but it can be like, I learned the importance of research and I learned how research is an essential part of medical care um, because it is an essential part. And I think it's really about that more than, you know, what specific research you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a point that um, both my fellow panelists have touched on, like it's, it's really not about the numbers, like with Danielle and both and Abernus speaking, like you can tell that they're really passionate about what they're doing. Like even if Danielle hadn't spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on um, music and memory, like you can definitely tell that she's passionate about that. And that really comes across um, on your application um, and during your interview as well. So that's the important part, not the number. Absolutely. All right, thank you everyone. I wanna keep the conversation moving because we've only got about 45 minutes left. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, I do just wanna put out one more plug for everyone who's watching. Uh, keep in mind that we do have a little bit of a sweepstakes going tonight. So there should be a link uh, within the chat about, uh, about how to in enter to win for that sweepstakes. Uh, continuing right along then, uh, let's talk next about the personal statement since I know that is a big, big part of the application. Uh, I'm curious for each of you, when did you start writing your personal statement and how did you narrow down what exactly you were going to write about? Um, I started, oh, sorry. No, okay. Fine. I started um, a month in advance. I don't know if that's too short or too long, but I can tell you, I love writing. So <laughs> in another life, like I'm a poet or an author or something. <laughs> So maybe, you know, if a month was too short, it's because I knew I could crank it out. If a month was too long, it's because I just wanted to sit there and keep writing. It was my favorite thing to do. Um, I might be cheating when I say that my personal statement was centered around one story. So it made it a little bit easier for me. So every time I tell people why I wanted to be a doctor, I have the same story I tell. I'll give you the abridged version. I was working in home care. I was assigned a client that nobody else could handle because she had end-stage dementia and was very combative. I Something about her name on the chart stood out to me, and I realized after a couple months of working with her, it was because she had founded the public library in the town that I was working in and several scholarship funds. She was a huge trailblazer it, for women and for her community in this tiny, tiny town I grew up in. And so I realized, you know, this woman did so much for people in the world, and now I'm changing her briefs. And it was a really humbling thing. And I realized, you know, she's given a lot to the planet. And if I can give one ounce of good back to her, then I'm doing something good. And my entire personal statement centered around that. So I always tell people, find your why, find your why, find your why. It might not be, you know, a cheesy story like mine. It could be, um, you know, maybe someone in your family had surgery. Maybe you had an illness growing up. But having your why and being able to articulate that is very important. And also if you have something that might be a potential, not necessarily weakness, but an Achilles heel that interviewers might come at you about, this might be a good time to bring it up. So for me, I spent so much time working in home care and I spent so much time talking about, you know, compassion and empathy and giving that to people that I was worried people would ask me, well, why don't you just go be a nurse then? Why are you going to be a doctor? Why won't you be a nurse? It sounds like you'd be a great one. So the second half of my personal statement was why I want to be a doctor and not a nurse. So both those things fit together really well, my why and my counter why. Um, so that, that's how I wrote mine. I think that sounds, sounds great. And I love the idea that you crafted a cohesive, uh, a cohesive theme around this very powerful story uh, that also addressed any concerns that people might have. Sounds, sounds perfect. I am amazed that you got it done in a month, though, I have to say. I, I love writing, and I had some really strong editors, um, some of whom work for Kaplan, another <laughs> Kaplan plug. So I, I love writing, and I had great people helping me with it. There you go. I've never said about you. So I spent over three months in my personal statement because I absolutely hate writing. It's my worst, like, skill ever. Um, 
I actually started writing out like single sentences that made no sense and were not cohesive with each other and I bulleted them. And I was doing it wrong because, and it's something that I always tell um, the people that ask me for help with their personal statements. I was trying to be like this perfect human being in my personal statement or like be super superficial and just talk about my qualities and this and that. And my biggest mistake was that my personal statement wasn't personal. Um, and I think that it is a very, very common mistake is to try to like not dig deep and just keep it like pretty and keep it sweet. And, and it's really all about digging deep. Um, it's your one chance to express who you are before you get interviewed. So the rest of your application is just numbers and activities and this and that. And I think your personal statement is the one thing where you can absolutely shine and not be compared to anyone else. Um, so I dug deep and um, I, was, I had recently suffered uh, the death of one of my aunts. Um, she suffered with cancer for over a year. And actually that was the experience that um, hit home for me and, and told me like, I want to be an oncologist and I really want to stop people from dying from cancer. And it sounds cliche, but it's really what I want to do. So don't worry about sounding cliche. Don't worry about saying stuff that others might have said before, because it's your story that's going to make it super unique. Um, so yeah, that's my recommendation. And that's what I did. And honestly, it's, it feels good because you're actually like pouring yourself into that paper and you're going to feel good because you know that when they read that, they're going to get to know you and not just like a 4.0, whatever MCAT student. It's going to be a human with feelings, with weaknesses, as, um, as she was saying. And that's the most important thing about the personal statement, making it super, super personal. I think that's a phenomenal point, one that's, that's often lost on students. This is not a science paper we're writing. It's not a resume. Mm -hmm. It is a personal statement. Adriana, how about you? Yeah, so I actually um, had a little bit of a unique experience in that I started writing my personal statement in December. Um, so I know that sounds really early. That's like six, six months early I guess um, but the reason why I started in December is because the um, like the health professions admissions committee at my school um, actually has a program where they, where they will help you um, like with advising and they'll set up meetings with you and stuff and they will write you a committee letter which if your school um, FYI has a committee that will write you a committee letter you definitely want their committee letter um, anyway, so at Rice, the only way that they will write you a committee letter is that if you get all of your letters of recommendation and a first draft of your personal statement in um, by the end of January. So you have to have recommenders picked out and you have to have, um, you know, like a full draft of your personal statement. And it has to be like genuine, like you can't just have written a paragraph on it. So, um, oh, and that's kind of why I was laughing in the beginning because I was totally scrambling to get, you know, four recommenders by January when, you know, it wasn't even due. Everyone was like, why are you asking me for a letter right now? This makes no sense. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, I started writing in December and I ended up having a draft by January, which um, was actually really great because then throughout that um final semester of my junior year, I didn't have to worry about, you know, like thinking about what I wanted to write about and, um, you know, like formulating kind of like a, a skeleton for my personal statement during school. Um, so I, I, you know, I had my draft and I sent it to a bunch of people during the school year to look at and I would, you know, like periodically when I when I had time between exams, I would go through the edits and, you know, send it back to a bunch of people. So I would definitely recommend starting early and then sending it to as many people um, as possible to get feedback on it because multiple different opinions is really good. Um, but the only caveat to that is that I think I sent it to actually too many people to read because then people were like contradicting the other feedback that I got from other editors and then it was like really confusing. So at the end, I kind of just like had to, you know, do some self-reflection and be like, okay, like how do I want to come off with my personal statement and kind of edit it how I wanted it to be. In terms of the subject matter that you're talking about, I actually wrote about um, just one story as well. So I wrote about an experience that I had in the ED when I was rotating as an EMT during one of my student rotations. 
Um, and I think that if you guys are, you know, still doing your clinical rotation or, you know, clinical experiences and stuff, and you haven't, like, you don't really know what you want to write about, I think, like, keeping a journal or even just, like, writing down a couple notes about each clinical experience is really helpful. Because in your personal statement, usually students will choose to write about something clinically related. Um, and then in, um, you know, you want to be able to talk about how this clinical experience impacted you. And if, you know, something your freshman year had a really high impact, but you don't remember it by your junior year, then that's not really going to make for a really great personal statement. So it's a really good idea to kind of like write down, take notes about, um, you know, like what impacted you during each clinical experience so that you can draw upon those, whether it be, you know, just like one cohesive story or draw upon several to bring it back in at the end. I think that's an amazing tip, and not just for the personal statement, also for the descriptions that you'll be submitting when describing all of your extracurricular activities. That can be mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, something that I wanted to point out is that I didn't have any clinical experience when I applied to med school, and I always felt like I was not competitive enough compared to my other classmates who had like four years of clinical experience. Um, so I actually did what... Um, Danielle said, and I added that to my personal statement. And I was like, this is my weakness. I'm not going to let them exploit it. I'm going to exploit it myself. So I actually said, like, one of my last sentences was, I may not be the most experienced applicant, and I know I'm not perfect, but, and then, like, I sold myself on the, on the last two sentences, like, I'm not going to give up. I am absolutely here to, like, to the end. Um, I want to make a difference. And I think that boosted my my personal statement that bit like conclusion wise because um, you know they also want to know that you don't think as your, yourself as being perfect um, you do have weaknesses and they want to know that too so like tap into a personal thing but then also tap into what you want to improve or what you want them to know is your weakness and how you use that like how do you um, surpass your weakness or how do you get over that how do, how do you want to fix that um i think that's very important as well absolutely i think it's a great point a great point i don't want to spend too much more on the personal statement at the moment simply because we did just do a personal statement workshop last night and of course we do do those on a regular basis so if students are in the process of uh, uh of working on that keep an eye out uh and we will probably be doing another one in the not not terribly distant future uh, for now, though, I think we've, we've brought up the idea of letters of recommendation several times here, and I know we've seen a lot of questions about, um, uh, about letters of recommendation. So, Adriana, you mentioned it just a few, few minutes ago in terms of getting the letters in for the, uh, for the uh, admissions committee, or rather the, the uh, pre-med advising committee. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about who, how you went about seeking those letters of recommendation and, uh, and how you went about actually securing them as well, making sure that they were strong letters? Sure. So um, I guess how I started thinking about who I wanted to write my letters, I kind of went through, you know, all my professors because you do need um, science professor rec um, letter writers. So I went through, you know, all the professors that I had and I thought about who I thought that I was closest with. So I ended up picking two professors um, that I took classes with and then went on to TA with. Um, so I know that not everyone, you know, has that luxury where you can like take a class with someone and then TA with them and then, you know, keep growing that relationship and stuff. Um, but how I approach them and, and how I've always been taught to approach um, asking for letters of recommendation is asking your professors, if you're ready, write this down. Will you write me a strong letter of recommendation or are, do you think you're comfortable writing me a strong letter of recommendation? And that, that way, you know, your, your letter writer kind of has an out, like they, they don't have to just say no outright and seem like they're being rude, like they don't want to do something for you. They can just be like, you know, I don't think I know you well enough to write you a strong letter for medical school. And I know that this is a very important step for you. So asking it like that and giving them a way to politely say no is really great. And then that way, you know, you'll be able to get strong letters of recommendation and you won't get any like, uh, you know, like Adriana is a great student and that's it. Um, she would be great for medical school and I don't know why. So um, that kind of gives you a, um, a way to, you know, secure strong letters of recommendation without uh, seeming too rude in that, in that aspect. I think that's a great point, and particularly if any anyone you ask for a letter of recommendation pushes back, 
don't push it any further. I think that's that's something that I, I have heard some uh, some horror stories about from admissions committee members before. You definitely don't want a letter that isn't a very strong letter. Mm -hmm. so. Right, that's definitely a great point as well. Danielle, how about you? What were your letters? So I started early because I was, um, it was that one week where I wasn't sure if I was applying that cycle or the next cycle. So I figured either way, I'm going to get things going now, get the ball rolling now. So I was able to get a couple letters, you know, a year and a half in advance because I knew those particular letter writers well enough where I knew it was going to take them a year and a half to write the letter and get it back to me. So um, I had something I tell people is that you want to be cultivating these relationships from day one. And it's really tough where if you went to somewhere like the University of Michigan, where you're in these 100, 200 level courses with 500 other people in just one lecture hall and thousands of people taking that same class, it's so easy to get lost. So from day one, if you think this might, person might be a good letter writer, you know, get in the front row, ask questions before, during, after class and make your presence known. That's mm -hmm. one thing I regretted. I didn't have a letter writer from a science um, class who I had a long standing relationship with and that was a big regret. I was able to make up for it by, um, I did sit in the front row and we did interact with him, not necessarily asking questions. We were always joking around with him before and after class. So when it was time for me to ask for the letter, I emailed him asking if he would meet up for lunch with me. And so we could talk over, just get to know each other a little better. And then I could ask him about writing a letter. And it seemed like something a lot of people at my school did to make up for the fact that you're one in a million, basically, in some of those lecture halls. Another big tip and something that I'm glad I did was go online on AMCAS is like the thing that does the application for you. It's like the common app of applying to med school and they publish a lot of stuff. There's so much info on the website. A lot of questions that you might have about applying have been answered on there and they publish a letter writer's guide. So if you Google like med school or AMCAS letter writer's guide, it'll have a PDF that you can not only share with your letter writers to get them, you know, brainstorming ideas to write for you, uh, but also you can pick who you're going to have write your letters to hit as many of those things as possible. So I had my letter writers be one of my bosses at Kaplan, uh, one of my bosses for a job at, uh, at my school through the study group program, one of my bosses for uh, my clinical experience job, a professor that was in the evolutionary anthropology department, but I took half a dozen courses with her, some at the undergrad level, and she invited me as an undergrad to take grad level courses with her. So we had a very long standing relationship. And then that one physics professor and each one was curated because they spoke to a couple different strengths in the letter writer's guide. So I knew that I was giving the admissions committees as much of what they wanted as possible because I picked my writers that way. So, you know, Adriana said, ask your letter writers if they can write you a strong rec because you don't want a wishy-washy rec. But at the same time, you know, it's helpful to bring up, you've seen me do X, Y, and Z in this setting. Are you able to write about, you know, my strengths in that setting that you've seen? I think that's a phenomenal point. Oftentimes uh, giving that, that type of guidance without telling them what to write, but telling them what you're hoping is reflected in the letter uh, can help to make your, your application seem that much more uh, uh, sculpted, I guess I want to say, or thematic, uh, and, and you really get across the narrative that you that you personally are trying to convey to med schools. Abernus, how about you? Well, I had a super weird experience with my letters of rec, and I don't think anyone has ever had this experience ever, um, so listen carefully. Um, I actually did not have any good relationships with my professors because I was kind of the go to class, come home, go to class, come home kind of student. Um, so when I realized that I had no one to ask for letters of rec except for my PI, for my research, I freaked out and I basically asked anyone who was around. Um, and it was a very horrible experience because I had such great GPA, such great MCAT, and I was like, wow, I probably may not get into med school because I didn't find that one or two letters of rec that I needed. So don't leave that for last minute. It's really something that you have to build since your first year of college. Um, so what happened was when I asked these two professors to write a letter for me, they actually said, since it's so last minute, you're gonna write it yourself. 
and then we're going to sign it if we agree with it. Um, so I had to talk about myself, not only for my personal statement, but also in two letters of rec and not make it seem like it was the same person writing it. Uh, it was a crazy experience. And I already told you guys, I hate writing. So it was a horrible experience to say the least. Um, but yeah, that was my, I really regret doing that because I, even though obviously my letters turned out awesome because I wrote them, but it's really not what I wanted to, um, to apply with, you know, I wanted like an honest straight down letter, but I didn't cultivate that during my college years. So I really didn't have anyone that could speak well of me um, as I wanted to. So uh, if I could go back, I would definitely uh, change that for my application process. And of course, that's something that, like, as you said, that's a change that, that starts much earlier than just the application process. It's fostering those relationships throughout your undergrad years. Very good. Um, one plug that I just want to throw in here real quick, uh, Adriana, you mentioned this before, uh, but the idea of committee letters is certainly something for students to consider as well. Uh, I see a lot of questions in the chat about uh, how many letters you need, who should you be getting letters from. Uh, Certainly a great place to start with this is speak to your pre-medical advisor uh, or the advising office if, you're, if your school has a complete office for them. Uh, they will often give you very specific directions on what types of letters they're looking for, if they're going to do a committee letter or a letter packet for you. Uh, also, of course, then if, you're, if, if you don't have that option, then by all means, investigate the schools that you're interested in, uh, in applying to and see what their requirements are, because different schools have different, different types of letters that they're looking for, whether they're from science faculty or non science faculty or researchers or, or whatnot. Uh, so certainly uh, certainly doing a little bit of research on the school's website is a great place to go, uh, which I think is actually a great segue into our next topic. How did you pick where you actually wanted to go to med school and which schools you would end up applying to? So Daniela, maybe you can, maybe you can start us off there. Definitely. Um, for schools I was applying to, I uh, paid $25 to get the, I think it's the MSAR. You can find this on the AMCAS's website. Um, and it's a PDF or it's like a searchable online tool where you can see every school's um, like demographics. You can see ages, you can see how old the school is, whether or not they focus on research. But more importantly for me, uh, their MCAT ranges, their GPA ranges, and also whether or not, um, like what their breakdown of in-state versus out-of-state students is. Because as someone from Michigan applying to schools all over the country and a bunch in Michigan, you know, I'm not going to waste my time applying to an out-of-state school that only accepts like 3% out-of-state students. So really doing your research beforehand and making a big master list. I, um, first made that list and it had about 25 schools. I looked at it and I was like, you can't afford to apply to 25 schools. So I pared it down to 14. I believe the national average of what people apply to is closer to 16, but 14 was honestly all I could afford. And I, in terms of geography, score ranges and demographics, I thought, I felt comfortable that I was casting a wide enough net. So at the end of this entire process, it came down to me being torn between two schools. Oh, well, I, I, of course, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, pick, you know, apply to schools for the most part where your numbers fit. Uh, because as mm -hmm. someone with a lower GPA, you know, I was able to look at schools with each, you know, GPA breakdown and see where I might be a little more competitive. And so after you have your list, you do the applications, you do all your interviews. For me, it came down to two schools. So my current university, Tulane University School of Medicine down in New Orleans, Louisiana, and a school up back home in Michigan. Um, and I cried about it for six months, um, waiting and thinking and just tossing and turning at night because I didn't know where to go. And after a lot of soul searching, a lot of talking to people, I decided that I had to go to the one that scared me the most. And of course that one was, you know, up and leaving everything I knew and loved, up and leaving the place and the state that I was born in and that I loved so much, my boyfriend of several years, my best friend, my family, everything, and moving all by myself to a city that feels like it's another country or another planet sometimes. If you've been to New Orleans, you know what I'm saying. It's very different down here. And I did that because, because two reasons. One being, you know, 
I like to think of people and especially myself as like a goldfish and you will grow to the size of the bowl that fits you. So you'll grow and you'll rise to the opportunity that you're faced with. And if it's something scary that you know is going to challenge you, if you put yourself in that situation, you know, I expect myself to grow and rise to the situation, which I think I'm doing an okay job of doing down here. Uh, but also, I was born and raised in Michigan. I didn't know anything outside of the Great Lakes. And I was 23 years old at the time deciding. And, you know, when else in your life are you going to have the freedom and the opportunity to just up and move like that? You know, after med school, you have residency and you're starting a family. You have to take your kids to violin lessons. And then your husband has a job in one place. And you can't just go and start over somewhere else. And so doing that and being able to start a completely new life and new chapter down here in Louisiana has been honestly one of the best experiences in my life. I, I really refer to myself as Michigan Danielle and Louisiana Danielle because they're very different. In Louisiana Danielle, it's a lot stronger and a lot more tenacious. And I'm so glad that I made that decision. So, you know, I have a good friend from undergrad who's torn between two schools, one's in state, one's out of state. And I told her the same thing. You know, if you're torn between two, do the one that scares you the most. And I think that you grow the most from it. I think it's a great point. It certainly seems to fit with, with, uh, with your personality and your experiences. Mm -hmm. Adriana, how about you? How did you, how did you choose to, to head all the way over to, uh, to Maryland? I know that's home for you. But... Yeah, so I also use the MSAR. Um, I highly recommend it. It was a great resource for me, especially because um, with my numbers, I guess, like applying to schools that were kind of like within my, my numerical range, I was not really like in the middle, but I, you know, there were a lot of schools where my numbers would fit and a lot of like schools where my numbers could probably potentially fit. So I actually ended up applying to close to 30 schools, which is a ton. And it's a lot of work in July when secondaries come. Um, so yeah, that was fun. Um, <laughs> but I, I did apply to a lot of schools just because I, you know, I really wasn't sure where I wanted to go. Um, I thought I wanted to be geographically on the East Coast. So most of the schools that I applied to were in the East Coast. Um, and the reason why I wanted that was because I had gone away for undergrad. So I went to Houston for undergrad and then um, I decided that, you know, I wanted to come back and be closer to my family. Um, mostly because I have a younger brother who's 11 years older than me and I kind of like missed him growing up since I was in college. Um, so I wanted to be a little bit closer to home during med school and have that family support as well. So that's kind of um, why I decided to come back to Maryland um, or one of the reasons. Um, another reason that I wanted to come um, to Baltimore specifically um, where the University of Maryland is is because I'm interested in working in a city in the future um, and working with the specific um, kinds of patients that we see here at the University of Maryland. So I was also choosing between two schools at the end that I was really torn about. Um, the other school that I was choosing um, between, I really liked their curriculum, um, but you know there were just some characteristics about it that I wasn't sure um, that, that, you know, would kind of like mesh with what I wanted out of medical school. So I ended up choosing University of Maryland for, um, you know, its geographic location, as well as the patient population that I would see here. Excellent. So you went with the choice that was a little less scary for you, but for different reasons, it sounds like. Right, right. Great, great. And Adris, I want to hear your story in, in, in just a hot second, because I know I know you've got a slightly different perspective on things. But before we get there, we did get a, a good question from Heidi and Danielle and Adrian. I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this. Did you take into consideration in-state versus out-of-state tuition when making your decision? Uh, and, and how did the cost of medical school affect your tuition? Or, it's, 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 excuse me, affect your decision? I was in a weird place where both of the schools, the in-state and the out-of-state were private. So at the end of the day, they would have been basically the same debt I was taking on. If the situation had been in-state was half or a quarter of what I'm paying at Tulane, I would have thought a little harder about my let's go move to New Orleans thing that I did with myself and my cat and dog. But I don't regret it and I think I'd still make the same decision. Our dean of admissions at the school and a professor um, uh, as an MD, MBA, and at one of the first talks he gave to us in med school was, you know, he did all the MBA math and magic and made all these charts and graphs and numbers and showed us that, you know, you'll survive the debt 
yeah, I know I'm taking on a heck of a lot of debt. It keeps me up at night. I'm not going to lie about it, but I trust my earning potential and my ability to repay it afterwards. So, you know, I'm doing this all on loans. It's not pretty. It's not the most fun and it is scary, but I trust, you know, the graduates coming out of the school. I trust every other doctor who's paid off loans and I know that it's possible. So while it is and should be a big part of your decision, you know, it's, it, people are always going to need doctors. You're never going to be out of a job. It's not that type of debt. So it should be a big part of your decision, but shouldn't be the only thing you're thinking of, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Adrian, your thoughts briefly? Yeah. So I actually um, chose Maryland partially because it was in-state and had cheaper tuition. Um, the other school that I was considering actually ended up giving me um, a partial scholarship, but it still wasn't, um, you know, it offset the balance a little bit, but it wasn't enough that, you know, the, that it was like cheaper and all the other factors that went into my decision um, ended up, you know, still pulling me towards Maryland. So at the end of the day, like finance was a factor. Um, but as Danielle said, like, you're going to be able to pay off the debt. Like I'm on loans right now too. And it really sucks. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're a doctor, you'll be fine paying off the debt. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know that you both mentioned the, the MSAR, just for clarity's sake, that's the Medical School Admissions Requirements Resource published by the AAMC. Uh, as Danielle mentioned, it's an, an interactive database online uh, where the AAMC collects information from all the accredited MD granting schools and publishes it for you. Uh, it's a phenomenal resource. And I only bring it up because one of my favorite stats in that database is the average debt that uh, students from the institution graduate with. So if you want to give yourself a heart attack, you can certainly take a look there. <laughs> Uh, now, Abner, I want to make sure we get to your story as well, because I know you took a slightly different track to deciding where you want to go in med school. Yeah, um, I stay close to home. Um, and it, it's actually similar to their stories in the sense that I actually stayed home because I couldn't afford um, going to the U.S. Uh, so I've been here, like I studied my college years here and I've stayed for medical school. Um, I know that for my residency, I want to travel, but um, yeah, I actually money was like my number one cause for staying here. My family couldn't afford it. And it was just like too big of a, a way on my shoulders to pay for it all alone. So even though I, I do have a loan now, it's obviously super small compared to what I would have had if I would have traveled to the U.S. But um, it was my it, it was my dream to to study medicine in the U.S. So I I wish I could, but it was really like a no brainer for me in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that, that uh, studying closer to home has, has impacted your, I guess I want to say the support network that you have for medical school. Itself? Oh, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, I'm living on my own, but my mom pretty does all the chores for me. She brings me food. She brings me like um, groceries. It's amazing. I mean, I know I've like, I live alone, but I don't really live alone. I don't actually do any of the stuff that people who live alone do. Um, so I, I, I'm really thankful for that because having my family here, I don't think I could have done it without them. That's, that's such a beautiful point. And that's something that I'm really envious of these two other women about because I'm very close to my siblings and my parents. And when I moved down, the homesickness was next to unbearable. Um, and there are, there are days where I, I just so wish I had, you know, a mom or my boyfriend here or someone who could just, you know, walk my dog for me when I have to cram for an exam. And it is, is really tough. So I, I still wouldn't do anything differently. I still know that this is where I meant to be, but at the same time, it's, it's not something you should take lightly, you know, being that far away and having to rebuild a, a support network and then, you know, your current support network having to do it all via FaceTime. It's, it's tough. Yeah, very much so. All right. Well, this has been a great conversation. We've got just a little over 10 minutes left. It's crazy how fast this time has flown. Um, the one topic we haven't quite gotten to yet is the interview, of course. And I want to make sure we spend a little time on that. Uh, specifically, I'd love to talk a little about the different about, the, about your experiences in the interview, of course, but some of the different experiences you may have had with the traditional interview versus the MMI interview format. Uh, so, Abner's, I know you said you had more of a traditional view and and, yeah. and or a traditional interview, I should say. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about what that experience was like and uh, and how you handled it? Okay, so it was really scary because the first 
like the first thing that they told me when I sat down was, hi, Abneris, tell us about yourself. And in that moment, I realized that talking about myself is just about the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Because, I mean, you may know your weaknesses and your strengths, but talking about them and selling yourself to another person who doesn't know you is really, really hard. So um, it was more like a, an open question interview for me. Um, they didn't ask specifics about anything in my life. They just told me, like, what have you done in research? What have you done um, in volunteering? How has that helped you grow? And it was really just about tying every single experience that I've had in volunteering, in research, um, with my family, with work, everything I've ever done, and talking about how that makes me a better applicant and how that makes me a better human um, and how that will make me a better doctor. So um, there's the, like, when I was in college, I was a I was a dancer and I was actually in a company, which was pretty cool. Um, and I actually talked a lot about my dancing in that interview. It it was absolutely unrelated to medical school, but I used my dancing as experience to talk about how I am so determined to like do sacrifices and I don't give up, and how dancing teaches you. Um, like a, a, a lifestyle of like commitment that I'm used to. And I really totally like used all of my experiences in dancing and everything and made it seem as though each of that, like each one of those made me a better, will make me a better doctor in the future. So yeah, that's what the traditional interview I think is all about. Perfect. And I think you described it perfectly. It really is all about, about speaking to everything you talked about in the application and tying together that cohesive story of you are going to be a great doctor. Exactly. Now, Adriana, I know you had some experience with the MMI. Mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, the MMI um, sounds scary, I know, because it's kind of a new thing and you have to do like 10 billion interviews. So it sounds really scary. Oh, and you need to prepare and like know, like actually know stuff that's not just about yourself. But I actually had so much fun. So I had an MMI interview actually as my um, my second interview of the season, and um, I, you know I was I was super nervous. I had heard about MMIs. Um, I knew that you know I needed to kind of prepare, like know a little bit about politics and health policy. Um, and like ethics and stuff like that. So um, the school that I, I uh, ended up doing my MMI, my first MMI at actually um, sent us like resources um, to prep for the MMI. Cause I, I think they know that, you know it's a relatively new thing. So they actually sent us the McMaster University um, PDF uh, file and McMaster, if you guys don't know is the first university that started the MMI. So they sent us that file just so that we could you know kind of familiarize ourselves with the format. Um, and there are also some practice questions at the end. So you can kind of get a feel um, of what you're doing. So just an overview of what that's kind of like um, at the school that I was at, you're actually split into two cohorts. So one of the groups goes on a tour first and one of the groups does the MMI first. Um, I was in the group that did the interview first and I was so thankful that I did the interview first because I would have just been freaking out the entire time and I wouldn't have like, um, you know, learned anything about the school on the tour. So I ended up doing the MMI um, in the morning and how it works is that everyone kind of gets a door to stand in front of. It's like a hallway with like 10 doors or something. Everyone gets a door to stand in front of um, and then there's like a sign on the door and there is um, a clipboard or, you know, like a piece of paper or something that you flip over um, when they like ring a bell. So you have a certain amount of time to read the prompt and then they'll ring the bell again and then you'll go into the room and start discussing the situation. So my general advice for the MMI is that you want to read the situation. So usually it's like a scenario, like a, like a patient case or something. Um, and then it asks you about your opinions. So what you want to do is you want to um, explore both sides of the issues and you'll have scrap paper um, during your MMIs as well. So you want to explore like the pros and the cons of whatever situation uh, you're given. And then after that, you want to take a side. So you don't want to like go in and be really wishy-washy like, oh, well, it could go this way or it could go that way. As a physician, you're going to be required to make a choice. And that choice is going to be either, you know, based on your own knowledge um, in coordination with the patient, with the patient's family, but you're going to have to make a decision at the end of the day. 
So in MMIs, they want to see that you can make a decision. So once you go into the room, you're going to explain um, both sides of the situation and then give your decision on the situation. And definitely when you go in, be prepared for the person who's sitting in the room to disagree with you because they will. And that's, you know, it's a basis of a discussion. Um, and then each rotation-ish is about seven minutes. So you usually have uh, somewhere between nine and 11, seven minute rotations. And sometimes they'll have like a 14 minute block where you'll have a personal interview as well. Excellent, I think it's a great description. Are there any specific uh, MMI scenarios that you encountered that you'd like to share with us or? Um, I can't, I signed a waiver agreement that said I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> I had a feeling that was the case, just wanted but to be. If you guys follow us on Twitter, there's a girl who's been doing MMI Mondays who has been tweeting out sample MMI questions. So if you either tweet at us or scroll through our timeline, you'll see some sample ones. And like Adriana said, there are some great resources online that schools will either send you or you can dig up for practice questions. Absolutely. Yeah, if you great. just Google like MMI practice, um, a bunch of stuff will come up and that's how I practice for my MMI. Absolutely, excellent. All right, team. Well, the clock is winding down. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, so I just want to I want to start transitioning out to some of the student questions, but also I want to ask one more one more question to each of you, specifically on the subject of rejections and acceptances. Uh, I know that, that that idea of getting the rejection email versus getting the acceptance email can be very nerve wracking for students. Uh, is there any, any advice or any insights from your own experience that you'd like to share with everyone in terms of how to, how to manage that, uh, those feelings? My thing was being, being confident in my abilities. So I knew I wasn't the strongest applicant number wise. I knew my clinical experiences and work experiences were pretty good, uh, but I, in my experience in the Miss America organization, I know that my interview skills are like a 10 out of 10. So I knew, you know, I just need to get that one interview. I need that one interview and I'm in. And Tulane was my first interview. It was my first acceptance very early in the cycle. I was, I was right. <laughs> so, um, you know, be, be trusting of your, your capabilities and what you are and what you bring to the table because I was at an Airbnb getting ready for an interview at another school when I got the rejection email from the University of Michigan where I did my undergrad. And that was a stab in the heart. I didn't care that I was already in a two lane. Getting rejected from Michigan was a stab in the heart. You know, watch your favorite pet die a million times over and over. And then I had an interview the next morning, you know, so you just have to trust the fact that you are what you are. You have your package, you know, you can't change your interview package or your application package after the app is in. So just keep trusting that those interviews will come. And then when that interview comes, knock it out of the park. And that rejection is just kind of part of life. You have to roll with the punches in life as a human and as a doctor. So get used to it now. And there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Great advice. Abner, how about you? Um, so actually, I had like a different story because I only applied to the Puerto Rican schools. And after I got accepted in the first one, I actually emailed all the other ones because I actually got in like got in early on the one that I wanted the most. So I played it safe and I told every other school like I don't I already have been accepted and I didn't want to receive the rejection letters. Um, but um, as Daniel was saying, it's all about trusting your package and what you know you have. Um, you know, you spend like four or five years preparing for this. Uh, you spend two months preparing for the MCAT and it's really all you can do. Like, don't freak out about it. It, it happens. We all get rejected. I mean, even the people who got into Harvard probably got rejected by some other schools. So it's, it's really about trusting yourself and what you have. Thank, again, great point, absolutely. Adriana, how about you? So I applied to 30 schools. So, I mean, obviously I got rejected from at least some of them. Um, and no, I mean, like not just some of them. I got rejected from a lot of them. Um, just wanted to make that clear. So, um, you know, rejection is something like the other ladies on the panel said that you're gonna be facing as a physician. Like you're not always gonna be successful. And that's something that you definitely have to learn to deal with and learning to deal with that early is better than, you know, learning to deal with it later. 
So I think in dealing with the rejection, I was also lucky to get into the University of Maryland pretty early in the cycle. Um, so after that, I kind of, you know, like I at least had somewhere to go, which was great. Um, but, you know, working with the rejection, um, I, since I went to school in Houston, I ended up applying to the Texas schools through the TAMDAS application as well. Um, and for those of you who don't know, they, um, you know, kind of accept five to 10% of students who are out of state. So the chances are, you know, not super great for someone who's out of state, even if I did go to undergrad um, in Texas. So um, I kind of had to get used to that. You know, I pretty much got rejected from all of the Texas schools. Um, and then that, that happened pretty early on. So it was kind of like a setup, you know, I was kind of almost expecting it because, you know, I wasn't getting interviews as early as my in-state colleagues. And I was like, you know, like I kind of can feel that I'm gonna, you know, not really have a great shot at these schools since I'm out of state and interviewing later. Um, the other thing that I would say is that during your interview, like you'll, you'll like know. Um, during my interviews, I kind of like felt, you know, like I felt a connection with the school, kind of like what Danielle mentioned earlier, she felt connected with Tulane. Like I felt a connection with the University of Maryland. I don't know if it's because I'm from here or like I just really like the faculty that I interviewed with or whatever. But at the schools that I was accepted at, like I, I knew that I was gonna be accepted. I walked out of that interview and I was like, I killed it. I knocked it out of the park. Like I am definitely probably gonna be going here. Um, so, you know, you can definitely tell. And, and um, with that kind of confidence, like you, you, everything is set and done after your interview. So all you have to do is wait and you can't really change anything after that. So, you know, there's not really a point in worrying about if you're gonna be accepted or rejected, just trust that you did your best. Um, and, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, you'll figure it out later. It's not a big deal. Absolutely. As we can see, a big, a big theme in these responses is have trust, have faith in your in your efforts that you put forth already, and everything should then carry you through to the uh, to the to the ends, to the, the sweet end, I should say, rather than the bitter ends. Uh, we are officially at the uh, the nine o'clock hour here on the East Coast. So uh, after two hours, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I want to thank the three of you for offering so much insight into the process and for for sharing some of your uh, your stories with us. Uh, I think it's been been very insightful in a lot of ways. And, and for me personally, I want to say the big takeaway. Uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that I think has been reinforced in this conversation is that there is no one single path to get into medical school. It's, it's, there are many different paths and everyone makes their own way. Uh, but as long as you, uh, you stick with that, that effort, uh, you, you will find your way there in the end. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank, thank the three of you for taking the time out of your schedule this evening and wish you all the best of luck with, uh, with the rest of medical school as you work your way through. I know some of you have uh, good old USMLE on the horizon, not too far off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also, of course, want to thank all of the students who took the time to join us this evening. Hopefully you found this to be an informative conversation. Uh, I really hope that you that you enjoyed yourselves tonight and that you're finding yourselves more inspired than ever to tackle whatever obstacles you're facing in the med school admissions process. Uh, towards that end, I do want to make sure all of you know that we at Kaplan have plenty of resources available for you to help you navigate this difficult process, uh, not just limited to the MCAT, I should say. We spoke quite a bit about Kaplan's MCAT resources this evening. Uh, and of course, for those of you who do have an MCAT coming up in the, uh, in the not too distant future, uh, by all means, please take the time to, uh, to potentially schedule a, a consultation with us if you're ready to begin your prep, uh, prep very shortly. Uh, and even if you're still, still a ways off, as we talked about, a practice test is a great way to begin learning more about the exam and what's in store for you. Uh, in addition to those MCAT resources, though, I also want to mention uh, that we have uh, some new admissions consulting resources that you can take advantage of. So please feel free to take a look around our website or ask the, uh, the off-camera teachers who've been chatting with you in the, uh, in the chat box uh, to, uh, to direct you to some of those resources. There are some wonderful ones available there. Uh, without any further ado then, I do wanna go ahead and mention the, uh, the recipient of our sweepstakes that we mentioned at the beginning of tonight's event. Uh, we'll be giving out a $50 Starbucks gift card to, uh, I believe it is Sine Young. You've been selected through our drawing for the $50 Starbucks gift so congratulations, Sine. Uh, hopefully you uh, you are still around and, and are ready to receive that gift card. And hopefully you like a lot of coffee because $50 will <laughs> get you a fair bit there. It'll be helpful uh, in med school. It will definitely be helpful <laughs> in med school. Maybe sit on it until, until you actually get it, get accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. And of course, uh, one last shout out. I want to give a, a big shout out to all of the off-camera teachers who have been taking care of the
while we've been having this wonderful conversation. Uh, we certainly could not do do that without without their support here. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has been been a part of this wonderful event this evening. Uh, and of course, if you have additional questions, uh, as Danielle mentioned a couple times, go ahead and engage with us on social media, and we'll be sure to answer them for you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Best of luck with your uh, with your admissions efforts, and please stay in contact with us. Good night.